So we're going to start off, right? So I already wrote a lot of stuff already, but I'm going to go over it again because every time I go over it, something happens. So we're going to go over it this time because we're recording, right? All right. So look, so now the reason why we're doing this video is because we have, as a Hebrews like community, we have to step our game up, right? And I'm just going to be frank. And stepping our game up is we have to examine the language of the text, the context of the text, the historical and cultural aspects of the text. And in doing so, we can fully understand what is being conveyed here, right? So now you have some proponents that would say that the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which is Devarim, which means to debar, means to speak, or the speeches or words over again, uh, was reiterated when the Israelites came back from Persian captivity to set up shop with the, the, the walls, the temple, and the city again. So they say that the book of Deuteronomy was actually a codification or a revision or a compilation of the laws in a civil code format for the people there. Because remember, when they found the book, the people didn't understand. They couldn't understand. They said those who had understanding explained what was in the book to the people. So some textual criticists believe that the book of Deuteronomy was written during that time period as a civil code given back to the people to summarize some of the things that we see that's in Bamidbar, Numbers, Shemot, Exodus, and that we see in Vayikra or Leviticus, right? So the reason why we're discussing this is because in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a particular uh, verse that Hebrew Israelites use all the time, which is Devarim or Deuteronomy 68, 28, right? And uh, I'm sorry, 28, 68. Wow. Man, nobody corrected that. You were speaking too fast. Yeah, I know, right? It's okay. I'm going to edit that. All right. 28, 68, right? <laughs> all right. So this is the passage that we use a lot to validate that prophecy in the text is speaking about us, right? And what I'm saying is, we're not saying that it's not. We're just saying is you have to go back over the language to ensure that it really can apply, right? By understanding some of the dynamics of the language. I didn't want to get too deep because, you know, if you read the entire passage, there's a lot more things about Hebrew you can learn. But I just wanted to give some basics so that way my students over here, they came over here, right? These are all faithful followers of Hebrew Congregation of Atlanta. I'm just borrowing them for this session, all right? <laughs> So, you speak here too. Yeah, right? No, I don't know. Okay. So, so, what I'm saying is, I was going over a few things with them so that way you guys can see they caught on to it while I was teaching that you don't have to jump off a bridge now that we're saying that yeah, you revisit the text. You don't have to go up over a bridge. It's okay. To y'all out there, it's okay. If you need help, you can contact me. I'll definitely counsel you. I know some people that can do so. You'll be fine. Okay, you're still Israelite. Alright. So, let's go over a couple of things, right? So, the first thing is, I'm asking my students, what does parse mean when you hear that word parse? What does that mean? To separate. To parcel things out. Parcel things out to separate, which means that if I'm looking at a phrase, parsing just means what are the modifiers and what is the root. So you got to find what the root word is and look at the modifiers to that root. That's pretty much what it means. Okay. Basic term. I'm being very simplistic now, right? All right. Now, when we're looking at different nouns, you have nouns that are feminine, nouns that are masculine, whether it's singular, dual, or plural, right? Now, what I was teaching them is that when you look at a feminine noun, a lot of times it's really relating to something that's not a proper noun, right? It's relating to something that's abstract, right? For example, I use mitzvah and mitzvot, right? Mitzvah means law. Mitzvot means laws. And when you think about a law, it's not something you can touch, right? It's something that's abstract. It's a concept that's employed and people follow it. As opposed to a masculine noun like edX, which means what? Ground. 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 The land, land. something physical. Or shamayim, which is the heavenly realm. That is still concrete because mm -hmm. air, you can still breathe the air, right. you can still see these right. things, right? Empirically, right? Mm -hmm. It's not something that has to do with the mind. Right. So that's why I was trying to explain these things. So anytime you come across a word in, in, um, in uh, Hebrew that's masculine or feminine, keep these two concepts in mind, abstract and concrete, right? Now, I also explain verb stems, right? Three, three verb stems, more, but I, I refer to three. How, nifa, and a 
The reason why I'm using these three is because when you go to your Blue Letter Bible, you have people all the time that go to the Blue Letter Bible, they'll click on just the word, the, the Strong's number, and this is this is why you can't just rely on Strong's by itself. It doesn't teach grammar. You click on the Strong's, you see a whole bunch of entries, and they just pick one. Like, oh, I like this one. I'm going to jump on a knee file. And they don't even know what the hell that means, and they just jump right on it, right? You can't pick and choose. The reason why it's categorized as Kyle, Neat Kyle, Hit Kyle, is the reason why it's there is because it's talking about the tense that the actual verb is in. You have to understand what are the indicators for the tense, right? Mm -hmm. So what I was showing my students is something very simple. When you don't see a verb modified at all with a prefix, it normally indicates the cow stem, which is what? Active voice, right? When you deal with the Neat file, you'll see the Nun and the Hirik affixed to a verb, which will indicate the knee file stem, which means what? Passive. Passive. So active means the subject is doing the action. Mm -hmm. Passive means the subject is doing the action to himself. Mm -hmm. And the hit high out is almost the reflective voice. And it's almost like the, the subject is talking about themselves in a third person, almost, or reflecting on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the hit high out. And it's indicated for each one of these. So I show them that the indicator for a hit high out it's very easy. You look at the first um, four letters, which is uh, H-I-T-H, -H, right? So you're going to look for a H, and you're going to look for a T, right? And then you're going to look for the here underneath and the Shiva underneath the top. This will indicate for you when you have a hit pi out. Hit. H, Tirik, Ta. Hey, hit it top, hit by out, and that means the reflective uh, voice, or when the subject is talking about themselves in the third person, almost, almost like reflective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so now, learning a couple of these things, the last thing we want to touch on is what's called the consecutive wife, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mostly you're only going to really get that in biblical Hebrew because it's almost something that's an attribute of literature, right? Almost like poetry. Okay. When you look at uh, Shakespeare and an old English and the way he writes some of his words, you don't really say those in colloquial speech, the way right. it's phrased, right? right? Because right. it that's indicates right. it's a piece of literature, <coughs> right. and that's almost what we get the same sense. It's the narrative sense when we're dealing with Hebrew, right? You don't really have this in colloquial modern Hebrew, right? So all of these things that I'm saying is going to come into effect when we re-examine the text of Deuteronomy 2868. Now, the premise that Hebrew Israelites propose is that when we look at this passage here, it's referring to the transatlantic slave trade, right? Now, it can and it can't, and if it does, it's conditional. I'm going to show you why it's conditional. So we have this word Egypt here, which is Mitzrayim that I wrote here, right? Mm -hmm. So Mitzrayim stands for Egypt, mm -hmm. and it says in ships. Now, anybody has their Bible on them? All right, read the rest of the verse. We have literally in shall. Now remember, in Hebrew, start where, bro? After Hold on, before you go. In Hebrew, the sentence structure is typically verb, subject, object. So I have it almost set up this way. In Hebrew, you read it from right to left. But I have it from left to right so you can understand it in, in English almost, right? But it goes from right to left. You have verb, subject, object, right? So when you read it, it says what? And Yah shall bring the into Egypt. So he says, and Yah shall bring us in English. We're looking at subject first. So that's why it's rendered or translated, and Yah shall bring. So they're putting the subject before the verb. But in Hebrew, when you read it, it's the verb first and then the subject, right? So go ahead. And Yah shall bring the into Egypt, you into Egypt again, again with ships. With ships. All right. Again comes later when you look at the interlinear. I want somebody to read my interlinear so that way we can follow how it's, how it's written in Hebrew, right? So, not, so now read, what, read how it is there in Hebrew. So you've got to read it from right to left. The, the interlinear is actually giving you the literal translation from the original language to the translated language. It's giving you the literal translation. So it may not make sense in English, but to a person with the Western, I mean, um, Eastern Semitic uh, mindset, they'll understand it perfectly and they can read through it. So what does it say? And shall bring. And shall bring is the verb. Mm -hmm. The Lord. Okay, that's the most side of the subject doing the action. To Egypt. To Egypt. To Egypt, it says. So it's implied that it's you. Keep going. In ships. In ships. Now slow down. So the word we have here, in ships. All right? Now in Hebrew, you have what's called the preposition, right? What's the preposition? What is that? Anybody that knows grammar? Preposition. Preposition is in, on, with. It can be with. Okay. At. 
at as well. So we have a preposition. So the bait here with the uh, with the um, batak at the bottom, uh, we have an indicator here. This means in, right? In ships, right? So we have alt. Alt is what? And you have the holam tav. It indicates what? No, is it feminine, masculine? Feminine, feminine, feminine is a singular plural. Yeah. Singular. No, no. it's plural. Both. So anytime you look, it's an OT. Yeah. Ah, ah is singular. Mm -hmm. OT, ox is plural, mm -hmm. right? Just like in the masculine, there's no there's no suffix, but the uh, for singular, but the suffix for plural we see in, right? All right. So now we have a situation where it says. Egypt. Now we have in here. Remember, masculine means something yes, concrete. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that means that you're going to be brought to a physical place in ships. Mm -hmm. Now this ship is just a vessel, right? Anything can be a vessel to move cargo, right? In ancient times, it was normally referred to as what we put on a on the water to move an item. But a ship can also be something on land that you're using to move something from one place. A vessel that's used to move something from one place to the other. Kind so of in UPS this shipping. Exactly. Yes. There you, you say go. shipping and but they drive a truck. There you go, exactly. Or it could be it could be airplane. Right. They could fly right. if it was overnight. Right. So right. so you have the sense of you have the feminine sense of abstractness when it comes to ships. So some sort of vessel is gonna be used to move something from one place to another, right? right. Now when we look at the um, the TSK, which is the Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge. That is designed to give you what's called cross references, right? And what I'm what I'm teaching you guys here is what they use in seminary and theology school. No, I haven't been, but I taught myself this. And the reason why I'm, I'm just touting that is because I'm trying to show you guys that you're gonna learn it too. Sure. Just by knowing some basics, That's you know, because right. this information I believe should be readily available to the public so they can discern that the people in power is actually teaching them the right thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So the word there is Anya, right? And it can mean merchant ships. Well, how do we know it means merchant ships? We gotta go to a cross reference. So, anybody who has a blue letter Bible open? That's up there. Yeah, you can bring it up here. Get, here yeah, you go to uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 68. And I posted this on somebody's page today who was uh, making a reference to this actual passage, right? One, two, three, four. All right, now, and, and look, and right now, I'm just going over the language, right? Context, I'm going to deal with some context, but you also have the historical sense. Because we got to see what was going on in this time period and how this can apply to various captivities and situations that Israelites went through. I'm not going to deal with that now because it's going to be a long video. Let's deal with the language a little bit, right? So Deuteronomy 28, 68, and it says, And Yahuwah, or Yah, uh, shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Now, the ships should be H591. Somebody click on that. And now we're going to look for the lexicon here, right? All right, now scroll down. See, the word is Ania. So, Ani, N I, Ya. Ania, right? And scroll up. It's a feminine noun. Scroll up. Scroll up. It can mean a ship, and it says ship men when it's with this uh, word H582, which can mean seamen, that we know a seamen, people on the sea, right? So so the reason why this is important, you can click on that. You can click on that. Shipment, shipment. Because I wanna, I wanna show you that the sense can also be with reference to people on the sea, right? Scroll up, scroll up. Scroll down. Where is it at? Go, 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 go. It's still, it's still wait, wait, wait. turning. Oh, it's still turning? It's okay. Still turning. It's not even coming up. I heck. But we have the word. Oh, well, go up. Go up. Scroll up, We have the word enosh, right? Almost like the word enosh. Mm -hmm. Enosh, and that just that means what? What does the word enosh mean? Enosh actually means something. What does enosh mean? Anybody? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, it is because I'm. I was trying to look for something more specific. It's, I don't know why it's not bringing up H. Uh, type in H582 up here. Anybody? Enosh means a male that's a pilot that's navigating. So when you have Enosh here and you attach it to that word ship, Ania, it means a man that's piloting or navigating the ship. That's how you get the word ship, men or seamen, right? See? Of a man, of a man. It just means like a mortal person, right? So when you have Enosh with Ania, you have a man that's guiding the vessel, right? 
and the sense is literally can literally mean a it could be nowadays it could be an airplane it could be a car it could be a bus it could be a ship but we're gonna look for context right so um go back yeah go back yeah go back so i'm trying to find the verse that has them syntax all right go down there we go perfect go to first kings 9 27 click on that friend And this is when you look at the syntactical lexical analysis, right? So lexical has to do with the definition, and syntax is how you put two things together to form a word, a clause, etc., right? Or even a grammatical uh, statement, right? So now look, now look. First Kings nine and twenty-seven. It says, "Hiram, who's who was Hiram? Who was he?" That was the king over the time. Okay, sent in the what? Navy, his servants. And then it says what? And the syntax with H582 and H591. So we know 582 is Enosh, which means a mortal man. And we know H591 means what? A ship or a vessel. Mm -hmm. But we have this word in the Navy. So click on H590. This is why context is important mm -hmm. when we're looking at other passages, right? This is why the TSK, the Treasury of Scriptural Analysis, is good for cross-referencing, right? All right, so go down. Go down. It means a navy, navy of ships, a galley, a <coughs> fleet of ships. Let's go down. Now, another important thing, and I'm going to show you this when we go back. Gesenius Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon. Scroll up. Now, the reason why this is good is because this is giving you the sense and the different passages of the application of that word. That's what a lexicon normally does. It gives you the definition of the original language. It says commonly a ship or rather collectively a fleet, right? And it gives you the Arabic word as a vessel, especially a water vessel, urn, pitcher, so-called from holding and containing. So we said merchant ships, holding and containing, right? Compare conjugative words signifying ships are often taken as in English. Now, the, when you conjugate this particular word, you give it more of a sense and literally try to nail it down specifically to what that is doing and what it's for. Words signifying ships are often taken as in English from those. Click on this. Now, if you go to the Blue Letter Bible, I encourage you to click on the lexicon, right? From those, wait, wait, go up. Yeah, there we go. From those meaning vessels, compared to the Greek um, milk pile and ship. Uh, Herodotus, blah, 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 blah. First Kings 9, 26, 27, which we're reading, 10, 11, where it is joined with a verb, a masculine verb. Verse 22, Isaiah 32 and 21, in both these places with a feminine. In all these passages, it appears to be, wait, a collective to which answers the noun of unity according to the analogy of namina, visis, et singulari, titius in Arabic as one stalk of straw. So when we talk about, we're talking about a collective. So a fleet in the navy is normally recognized as one unit. Even the word ikhad can mean part of a unit of things, right? So I don't want to get too far from this, but let's go back. Now, the reason why that's important is because we're looking at syntax, right? We want to see what this is referring to, right? So it says, And Hiram sent in the navy his servant, shipmen that had knowledge of the what? Sea. So the word sea in Hebrew is what? Yam. So we have a yo. Oh, go down. I'm sorry, friend. Go to the top again. Okay, you have a yod, you have a kamet, and you have a final mem, right? Yam, that literally means a sea, right? And, and, and in the Ugaritic text, this was a deity of the sea, like Poseidon mm -hmm. in Greek mythology, right? It's like mut means death in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. It was a deity that was over death, right? When we look at the Ugaritic text, right? But scroll down, scroll down. I want to show you what this means. All right, this means, it can mean sea, and most of the concept, whoop, go up. It can mean C, and 321 places it means C. But Yam literally gives you the implication of a C or a body of water. So you go back. So we have a fleet or unit on the C, and it says shipmen. We have Enosh, this is the root word, and the word Ania. Ania means ship, men means, or uh, oh, we could do a plural, uh, but Enosh, the root word means men, shipmen that had knowledge of the C right here with the servants of Solomon. So now we know when we look at this word ship, at least when we have a syntax with this word Enosh, and look in the context of navy and sea, the implication that this vessel, which is abstract, is literally referring to a vessel that is on the sea. Are you following me? Yes. Okay, so let's go back. And what I just did was contextual analysis, no, wait, right? No, 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 so syntax syntactical lexical is looking for various words, how they syntax. Contextual analysis is reading the whole passage and these various words that you just define and syntax and how they work together to give you a better understanding. And contextual analysis will also be reading the entire chapter if you don't understand the verse 
um, uh, or you can read maybe the entire book also to give you more context, right? All right, so you got ships. All right, so now we have ships. Now remember, we said ships was feminine, right? We have up there, which means feminine plural. And ships also, again, is the abstract sense of a vessel, something that's used to move something from one place to another, right? So it can mean, in this case, we don't see water. We don't see water here, right? We don't see Enosh or a man involved in steering this ship, right? Uh, we don't see the word navy that we looked up there. So this sense can mean anything. It's really ambiguous. It can mean a vessel on the sea, a vessel on the earth, or any kind of vessel, right? So we want to deal with Egypt, right? And shall bring Yahuwah, or the Yahweh, Egypt in ships, right? So he's going to bring us back to Egypt in ships. Read the, um, the rest of the passage again, because I want people to see the context, right? After defining the words. So the context is, it says what? By the way whereof, By the way I, whereof I speak. Keep going. Unto you. Unto you. You shall, you shall see, see it no it more. No more. Slow down. Again. again. So why is this Most High is saying that he's going to bring you back into these ships by the way that I spoke to you, that you would see it no more again, because the objective was to get Israel out of Egypt. They become a separate nation without having to go back to Egypt for sustenance or anything else. Because remember, the Israelites who was in the wilderness disobeyed, and they wanted to go back to Egypt, which means that they will be putting themselves back under the subjugation of another nation over them because they didn't trust the Most High sustain them in the wilderness, right? So the reason why we're saying this is because the Most High said, listen, I brought you out of Egypt, not to send you back. I brought you out to be independent, sovereign, to be sustained by me, keep my statutes, laws, commands, okay. be a separate nation, yeah. etc. Yeah. But the problem was because of our disobedience, he's going to bring us back into wow. Egypt, right? Now, again, we have it in the masculine plural, which can mean literal Egypt. But when we read the overall context, somebody read Deuteronomy 28:36. You can read it. What does it say? Yah brings you and the sovereign whom you appoint over you to a nation which you, neither you nor neither your fathers, you nor your fathers have known. Wait, slow down. Back over here. Did the Israelites know the Egyptians? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. keep going. And there you shall serve other mighty ones. Other mighty ones. Wood and stone. Wood and stone. Now, go to verse 49. So now it's going to bring you to a place that your forefathers did not know. And you're going to serve other deities or other powers, other mighty ones. Go ahead. Yah brings a nation against brings you. Brings a nation against you. Go from ahead. afar. From afar. From the end of the earth. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. What was Egypt in relation to Israel? You can go right through the Sinai Peninsula and get right there, right? Around the block. All right. Keep going. As swift as the as, as the swift eagle. as the eagle. Wait, swift as the eagle doesn't mean we're talking about a literal eagle, but something that represents an eagle, right? And we know mm -hmm. America has the ego on the dollar bill, the ball ego represents America, right? Now, I'm not saying the text literally says America. I'm just saying it's giving an attribute to this nation that's afar. And we know that America is called the ball ego because the ego flies with freedom and liberty. So that's why we can attribute America to this particular prophecy. That doesn't mean that that is what was implied at the time because they didn't know anything about America. Right. But now that we are in the future and we can look in hindsight, we can also attribute it to the possibility or probability, probable means more than likely, possible means less than likely, to America, right? Because that's the attribute of America. Keep reading. Sure. As swift as the eagle flies, okay. a nation whose language... A nation whose what? Language. So the nation is going to be afar, and it's going to be swift like the eagle, and it's going to be where? I mean, the language is what? A language you shall not understand. You shall not understand. Now, did the Israelites understand the Egyptians? Uh, yes. Most definitely. Yes. The Abraham went and spoke to Perao or the Pharaoh. Uh, Yosef went and spoke to the Pharaoh, right? Um, who else spoke to the Pharaoh? Uh, Moshe went and spoke to the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. So the Israelites were able to speak, even if it was um, mutual intelligibility or if it was a lingua franca or a bridge language, we were still able to understand them. Now, when we look at the transatlantic slave trade, when the Israelites were taken, well, the Israelites, we call them Israelites, but when the Africans were taken into slavery, did they know the language of the oppressor, the ones that were being brought into slavery? No. No, because they were forced to lose their tongue because if they knew the language, they could unify together and overthrow the slave That's master. Right. So they wanted to remove them from the indigenous worldview and inseminate them 
with that Western worldview because when you have a Western mindset, you are going to have empathy for the oppressor mm. who is giving you that language. That's why language is very important because you don't want to always think like your oppressor because you start to have empathy for your oppressor and that becomes Stockholm Syndrome, right? Mm. So read the rest of that, a language that... Uh, a language, okay, read it one more time. And Yah shall bring a nation against you mm -hmm. from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you shall not understand, mm -hmm. a fierce-looking nation, fierce which looking shows nation. no regard for the elderly, elderly, nor show favor to the young. Favor to the young. And they shall eat the fruit of your livestock uh -huh. and the fruit of your land okay. until you are destroyed. All right, stop there. Until you're destroyed. So now, if you're looking at overall context, we can separate the passage of 68 to be something separate. But if we're going to take the quote-unquote codified um, uh, categorized category of how all the curses are lined upon one another, if we do it in that context, then that means whatever attributes that Egypt has is going to be within the context that we see in the previous verses, right? So what I'm saying is that we can also suffer this by going back into physical Egypt if we we're brought into a vessel back to Egypt. But any land, because the Israelites are going to be dispersed amongst the four corners of the earth. So if they're being dispersed amongst the four corners and they're under curses, all of them can't physically go back to Egypt. Can they? Can you? Is Egypt in all four corners of the earth in the literal sense? No, no. not in the literal sense. It, it has a locale, right? It means has a locale. So that means that we can apply this literally or it can be ambiguous depending upon context, right? Because before that, it says that we would be scattered. So you can't be scattered into Egypt in the four corners of the earth. Egypt has one locale. So why am I showing you guys this? Because, again, this can apply ambiguously, which means it can apply to various different things. So don't get scared, okay, when people say this. So we got the ships, right? Now uh, read the rest of the verse. So I'll bring you to Egypt again with ships, and then I want you to read the literal after that. Okay. We stopped it by the way we're of our space unto thee. Unto you, okay. You shall see it no more okay. again. Okay, keep going. And there you shall be sold. Now slow down. There you shall be what? Sold. Sold. Unto your enemies. Slow down. Now, you reading what? The King James? King James. All right. Now, family, I'm not saying throw the King James out. I would never say that. What I am saying is that in certain instances, the King James has it right. Some instances, the King James has it wrong. Tell it. And... Unfortunately, for a lot of us who have been dogmatized with that particular part of the text, we use the King James Version to justify it. King James Version says what? And there you shall be sold. Okay, and there you shall be sold. Now, if, we, if I was to write the word, and there, oh, I have it here. And, and you shall be sold, and there you shall be sold, the implication is what? And there you shall be sold. What is the implication here? Someone, someone, someone else selling is selling you. Someone Somebody else, else is selling you, right? And read the rest of it. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies. Unto your enemies. For bondmen. For bondmen. And bondwomen. And bondwomen. And no man, and no man shall, buy you. shall buy you. Now look over here. Now, we see some translation says the word slave. Bad translation. Slaves, the sense of slave in their time is different than a sense of slave from what happened in the transatlantic slave trade, right? Because there's two different That's contexts, right. That's right. two different periods of history, two different oppressors, etc. Yeah, all of that. So I say that because the correct term there should be bond men and bond women. Now, I have two lawyers here, right? What's a bond? If somebody gets arrested, they go where? To jail. So they go to jail, to jail. but a family member goes where? To the bail bonds to bail the to do what? To make a bond. Be 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 because a bond has to be set. A bond is a certain amount of money that has to be set to get you out. Okay. Then you can go to a bill's bondsman uh -huh. to put up a bail, uh -huh. which is a smaller amount uh -huh. to secure that you will return to court if the judge lets you out. There yeah. you go. Now, look, the same sense was back then at that time. So don't think in it the slave sense and the buying sense. Think as a bond man and bond, meaning that they, a price was set for them to be bought. Now, here's how you know you have an issue here. If it says, and you shall be, and there you shall be sold to your enemies, right? So the sense is somebody's selling you to your enemies as bondmen and bondwomen, and then the rest of it says, and no one shall what? Buy, buy you. Buy you. Now, how does that make any sense? Think about it. If, you're, if somebody's selling you to your enemy or another party, and they're not going to buy you, why are they selling you? 
Right. right. Exactly. Think about that. Does that make any sense? No. So your enemy, who's a straight, strong, great nation, is going to take you and sell you to somebody that's not going to buy you? That doesn't make any sense. Trying to say that we know slavery, but bartered, traded for, etc. Right. Okay. The Western world. The Western world. So now we have to re-examine this, right, in light of the language, and I'm going to show you why parsing is important. And we're going to parse this. Real quick. Now, there's there's various things in here, but I'm gonna stay with the basics so that way the wow. audience can go back and research it and you can you can pick it up, right? I don't want to go too deep, right? So, and you shall be so. So now we're gonna see that this translation is wrong. Okay? And I, I, I well, any one of my students can talk here. Whoever whoever is good with what I just went over. You? Alright. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you think, huh? Alright, so, right, so look. So now I'm going to erase this, and I'm gonna, we're going to we're going to redefine what this says, this word, says, right? Okay. Take this out. Why well, didn't get to show you these suffix? But the suffix is the implication of you or y'all, right? That's the suffix. Okay. All right. So now, oh, let me get this out of the way. Yeah, it's already there. Okay. You can do it. All right. So if we were to just write the consonants out of this, this would be this could be a. Wow, this is a hey, this is a top, or this is a M, this is a cough, which we would say is a K, this is a race, which is an R. We take care of our people here at the congregation. Hebrew congregation of the mind. We have time. We have research. We got our speakers. We got our elders over here. Whatever you need, we take care of our people here at the Hebrew congregation of the mind. After this commercial break. Right. So you have C. This is, this is how I transliterated it, right? Uh oh, you got the Alright. So before we get into this transliteration, I want her to identify certain things, right? The first thing I want to identify is what did I say this word? Shiva, consecutive Shiva. No, no, no. No, no, not consecutive Shiva. Just, I mean, just, just, I'm just this symbol, the diacritic mark. Oh, you said Shiva. Shiva, Shiva. Right? Yeah. And that means what? It's like a just in a simple pause. sense, a I pause. Mean, yeah, it's just a pause. Yeah, it, it means, means that. Yeah, it means that this consonant is an indicator within this word, right? So that's what that means. Now we have here this waf, and this is called the what you said? Consecutive. Consecutive waf, right? Now what I didn't show, and I'm gonna show it here, is that when you look at a root a root verb, right? Like for example, I went over this. This is an easy one that everybody can recognize. Right? What is this word? Ooh. No, no, this word. K Y K is opposite. Part of the most high thing. Yeah. K Y K means what? To exist. exist. Be, yeah. But there's no modifier to put it in the imperfect tense. So without the modifier, it's in the perfect tense and it should be past tense, right? Mm -hmm. Here sometimes people say it's a state of verb or it could be a state of being, because be is just a state of being. It's really not an action, it's a state of verb. But here it can this can literally mean existed because there's no modifier to put it in the future tense. So in Hebrew you have perfect and imperfect. Perfect means it's a completed action. Imperfect can mean it's an action that started at some point and it's still going on or an action that will take place. The best way to identify is reading the context of the passage or even the chapter to see if it's speaking about past tense, I'm sorry, present tense, something that's continuously going, or something that will happen in the future, right? Now, we saw the word there. It says, and you shall be so, right? Mm -hmm. And you shall be. Shall is what? Past, present, or future? Future. future. To, to give you the future implication, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, consecutive while we went over earlier, means what? It's, a, it's in biblical Hebrew. Mostly and only, and it's in a narrative sense, right? Mm -hmm. For literature, right? And you don't see it in a lot of colloquial speech. So the consecutive wav is here, and when you have this consecutive wav, it does almost the same thing as this yod does to this word, right? Mm -hmm. So the yod is third person, third person. Oh, it's the. And this is this is how you see it sometimes in some. It'll be like this, right? So this means third person, masculine, singular, right? So this is number, gender, and um, number, gender. I'm sorry, person, uh, gender, and Tent. number, right? Mm -hmm. So person, gender, number. So third person would be he, she, they. Masculine. Here we mean it would mean he. he. 
And singular won't be they, it will just be he, singular, right? Mm -hmm. So third person, masculine, singular. So when you add this here, this also puts it in the imperfect tense. So before, it could have been existed. But now when you modify it, it says he will exist. Right? So that's the modifier. Now the consecutive while does the same thing. The root word will be perfect tense. Anytime you have a verb that's not modified with a prefix, it's in the perfect tense. When you modify it, most of the time it'll be in the imperfect tense. And the consecutive while puts it in the imperfect tense. Okay? So that's the first thing we want to see. That means whatever the, the regular state of this verb would be, which would be perfect, the consecutive while makes it imperfect. The next thing is this right here, the hay and the top, right? So the hay and the top is a um, it's a modifier, right? Mm -hmm. So the hand and top, we went over three different verb right. stems, right? We went over ka, which is the active voice, nifa, which is the passive voice, and the, the hitpaya, which is the reflective voice, or the person talking about themselves, or doing the action with themselves in mind, in mind, mm -hmm. reflective. Mm -hmm. So now that's indicated by the hey, the hitik, which is it, and the ta. And anytime you see hit, it indicates the hitpaya. So bring up... Um, Bible the, yeah, Bible, the blue letter Bible. So I want to show people the error a lot of people make with the Hebrew language, right? When trying to click on it, when trying to explain certain things. And this is a perfect, perfect example. Oh, so the first thing is, first thing, oh, sorry, yeah. All right. So uh, I want you to click on H4376. All right. Now, uh, what was I saying? Uh, okay. <laughs> So what a person will do is they'll click on H4376. This is why knowing Hebrew grammar is important. Because if you don't know Hebrew grammar, you won't know how the root word is modified. Right. So what I teach people is that, how do you find the root word? You first have to understand the, the prefixes and the suffixes. So the root word is what? Makar. Point out to me. Where is it? Up. Oh, you got it? Can you see? Yeah. You got it? All right, so the root word is what? Makar, right? Yeah. M K R, right? Makar. Uh -huh. And then we have what here? Okay. Which means that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we have this, this means something, uh -huh. we have this, this means something, we have this and this means something. So when you look up the uh, strongs, the strongs will only give you the root. It's not gonna show you the other modifiers to this verb. And that's very, very important because a lot of times when we try to decipher the language and you're reading the text, the first thing people do is they'll go straight to the strong and coordinates. And they'll say, see, it means this in this passage. No, it doesn't mean that. You're just looking at the root. You're not looking at the modifiers. So a person that knows Hebrew will look at you and say, well, that's not right. That's just like if, I, if you look up the word, uh, if, I'm, if I'm speaking a sentence and I say, uh, Jane has understanding of the Bible, right? And let's say there was a strongs next to the word under, understanding. And we go to the root. And the root gives us the word understand. And we would say, we go back to the sentence and see here, see here, it says understand. If we didn't know the language, we say, see here, it means understand. And somebody who knows the language says, wait, wait, it doesn't mean just understand. You have ing, which is the present participle that's added to it. So that's how we have to know some grammar so that way we won't just take a Strong's word and say that's what it means in the context when it doesn't mean that. The second thing is looking at the various, go here, Makar. Go scroll up, scroll up. Um, down, I mean down, down. Okay, down a little bit more. All right, a little bit up, a little bit more. I just want, I want all of this. Up with a little down, down a little bit more. Um, use the use the hand. Nah, it's not gonna work. All right, that's okay. That's okay. Leave it here. All right. So what a person will do is they'll click on the strongs. They'll go here to see this entry, and they'll be like, Ah, uh, let me see. Pick one. Pick one. Ah, uh, to be so. That's what it means. There it means to be so. And they'll, they'll say it automatically and not understand why these categories here, why A, B, and C is here. They will have no clue why those three things are there. And a person that knows Hebrew will understand what these things mean because they'll go back and look for the modifiers to the verb and they'll know what sense is being referenced, whether it's kao, which means the active voice, nifa, which means the what? Passive, Passive. voice. And hitfaya means the reflective, reflective voice, right? So you see here, to be sold, to sell oneself. This one is to sell, kao stands. This is to sell oneself in the reflective sense, right? Because remember, 
Reflection has to do with the mind, and a lot of times it has to do with introspect and retrospect, depending upon the situation. So now, if we were looking at these three entries for the word makar, we look for the indicator, which was what? Hey, Back over here. Hey, it's the hey, the hey, the hey, hitic, and the time, or the th, right? The hit. Well, let us know when we go back here to the root. Oh, it's in the hit pile sense, which means to sell oneself in the reflective sense. That means I can't use kyl, I can't use nephile, I can only use entry C. And that's the problem when people don't understand Hebrew, is that they'll just pick one and think that's what it means. That's not what it means, okay? So let's get back, let's go back over here. So she identified a consecutive wah with the Shiva, which means that this means something. She identified the hit pile, which means what again? To reflect it. Reflect it. Okay, so it's a reflective, but it's the it's the it's a person reflecting on themselves, right? We have the root word here, which is what? Makar. And then we have tem at the end, which indicates like a you all, because uh, mm -hmm. that's plural, right? right? Tem means almost like you all, or right. you all, or y'all. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Y'all, right? right. right? Yeah. So now, if, I, if, if we was to go back and reword this, and I'm going to show you how the translators work. If we was to go back and reword this, how would, you, how would you translate this? How would you parse this? Or how would you translate this? If we had to go back and reword this. You have consecutive wav, you have the hit payal, you have the root word makar, and you have ten. Y'all, so you have uh, and will, and will. Mm -hmm. You have reflection on oneself, right? Mm -hmm. To be sold, y'all, or you all. Mm -hmm. So how would you go back and, and translate this? How would I translate that in the... In English. In English? Yeah. Um... There you go. Say it. Wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. And you will sell. Yep. No, no. And you will. So you got the and will you or y'all and y'all will hit hit pile is what? Sell. No, no, no. My car Reflect it. Myself. Oh, yeah. Myself. Or me. No, or, or I, or, or I. ourselves, or, or, yes. or and you will sell yourself. Yourself, like yourself. yeah, okay, yourself. Okay. And so now this is added on to here, right? So, and you will, and you will, and you will sell, sell the root word sell, uh -huh. yourselves, yourselves, your own selves. Yeah, your own selves. And so, you and sell you yourself. will sell your, your own selves. selves, right? And you your will sell your selves. own selves. But... I would translate it as, I would, instead of saying you would sell your own selves, it's almost sounds like the passive. Uh -huh. I would say, um, and you, you sell will sell yourself. Yeah. And you will and sell you yourself will, as well. And you will offer. Offer. Oh. Right? So reflective is more contemplative mm -hmm. in the abstract sense, right? As opposed to a physical selling off. So reflective is, and you will offer yourselves mm -hmm. offer so there would be more of an offering than a literal selling there because it's in a reflective sense okay. if, it, if it was and you will sell yourselves it would most almost be like a nephile sense right which we see up here but here is more like an offer something that's abstract something that's like a deal that you're doing yeah. as a, like i said like when you go in we, exactly there you go like like a job interview right it's you have right. you're right mm -hmm. you have a resume and you are there to sell the resume or sell yourself yeah. to the person that's going to hire you or the buyer. So you're offering, you're making an so offer to them of yourself. So you're not literally giving yourself or selling yourself to them. There's no transaction, literally. But it's an offering of yourself, mm -hmm. right? In a reflective sense, it's an offer, right? That's more reflective. The Nephi would be more physically, I'm selling myself, right? Almost like prostitution. And you'll see that sometimes in some other places with prostitution. It'll give you the sense of it, right? So here's the end. You will offer yourselves, and you and you will offer yourselves. So yeah. no longer you will be sold to your enemies, right. but and you will offer yourselves to your enemies. And then the rest of it says what? You can, as you can bonds. click back. As what? As bonds. As bondsmen women. and bondswomen, bonds not slave. Bondsmen are bondswomen because the offer has to do with a. Price. Right. And I gave an example of that looking at uh, Ruth and Naomi, right? And you had a king's re kingsman redeemer, right? And his job was to do what? What's the kinsman redeemer job was to, to do? Buy you back. 
to, to buy back. Right. So a purchase or a transaction is being made, correct? All right, so a bondsman, a bondswoman, so you're offering yourself for a price, a slave is just giving themselves. Uh, and somebody just, just no take way. them. You, sometimes you can buy slaves, sometimes you don't have to buy a slave, right? Because it, be, it could be a spoil of war, mm -hmm. right? A war, you can go in, fight a war, and you take the spoils. They're not selling themselves to you. You're actually right. just taking them, right? That's right. So this, a bondsman is more specific. So a bondsman, bondswoman, and what? And no man shall buy you. And no man shall buy you, right? Click on H7069. Redeem. There you go. Redeem. Purchase. Redemption for a price, right? Mm. Or it could, be, it, could, it could be higher if you're offering yourself, all right? So we have the word kana there. Kana, go down. Slow. Buy, get, purchase, possessed, owner, recover, redeem. But in most senses, it means buy or transaction, right? Now slow down, okay? Now also we have here the cow stem. Keep going. The knee foul stem and the hit foul stem. And now the hit foul stem is a causative action, right? Because you can have the causative active voice and the causative passive voice, right? Go back to the verse. Okay? And it says, and no man shall buy you. Right? So no man shall buy you. So we're talking about a man, no man shall buy you. We're talking about, uh, you have to um, uh, read the last two at the bottom. And no man shall buy. Okay. And no man shall buy. The implication is you. Mm -hmm. Right? And no man. Oh, oh I was trying to go to the it's okay. and, no, <laughs> and no man shall buy you. Now, we look at the King James and we see a word italicized. What does that mean? It was added, it was added to the text. Added for context. That means it's not originally there. Okay. Right. And it says, and no man shall redeem, no man shall purchase, no man shall buy you. Now, if we was to look over this again, and the Most High shall bring you into Egypt, which we said can mean literal Egypt based on the wording, or it could be symbolic of Egypt based on the context, again, with ships. And we said the word ship is a feminine abstract noun regarding to a vessel transporting something from one place to another. Contextually speaking, if we don't see water, if we don't see navy, if we don't see anything like that, it can mean, it can be ambiguous. It can mean a ship on the land or a ship on the water or a vessel from moving something from one bay to other. He says, by the way whereof I spake unto you, you shall see it no more again. Because the Mosai says, my objective is to purchase you out so that way you won't go back to Egypt. And he says, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies. Again, it's not, and you shall be sold unto your enemies. But the selling action is being done by who? Yourself. You, the people under the curse, they are offering themselves for bondage, I mean, for a price, and no one should buy you. So now, if we say that this refers to the transatlantic slave trade, okay, we're going to say that's ambiguous because there's other places in history where the Israelites were actually brought back into Egypt again, into captivity. Greco-Roman period is one example of that. Uh, and also, remember, the Israelites were spread across the four corners of the earth. That's, how we, that's why we also said that Egypt here can mean the land of captivity that we see in other references in the scriptures, and it can mean a place of bondage, right? Which ships, by the way, where I spake unto you that you shall see it no more, and then you shall, be, you shall sell your own selves or offer your own selves unto your enemies for bomb and bomb, and no one shall buy you. So now, if I'm looking at this last part, I can't say this part right here is referring to somebody selling us anymore. We're selling ourselves. When we went into captivity, right, off of the coast of Africa into America, we were not selling ourselves. We were being sold by somebody, right? So this part right here could no longer make a direct reference to that action. But if we was to take this and apply it to the atrocity that happened to us here in America as black people, what, in, in what sense can you apply Offering ourselves to our enemies and our enemies not buying us, not redeeming us, not dealing with us, not hiring us. In what sense would, could this be applied in America and the plight of blacks in America? How can this be applied? And I mentioned it before. Say again? There you go. Put the, put the camera on this, this brother right now. Say again? Employment. Employment. All right, bring it back. Employment. So now what I said was this can still apply to us if we look in the sense of employment. Now, remember, there were slaves that was in America. The majority of black people were slaves that was in America. And we were in slaves. We were under the slave master who used us to do plantation, build houses, make vineyards, all types of stuff that we never really got to enjoy formally, right? And then after slavery, you had the Emancipation Proclamation, the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had the 13th Amendment, right? Now, we was considered free, but were we really free? No, because now after we were released, 
you have a huge portion of disenfranchised blacks that just hanging around. Now, what happened was black codes were enacted via the politicians in the South and the ex-slave masters. And the purpose of the black codes was to disenfranchise the blacks from finding work. So they created laws such as the black codes, the pig laws, the vagrancy act, all these different laws to disenfranchise us and prevent us to go back to work or to work for ourselves. And we started to work for ourselves. They created state labor unions to interject to ensure we were beating regulations. So all of these things was done to disenfranchise us from working because they wanted us in the convict leasing program by way of imprisonment. So if you break a black code because you're not employed and you get caught and you don't have a job, you're going to jail. Pig law, if you find an animal that's straying away and you grab it and some slave, uh, ex-slave man say, well, that's my animal, you're going to jail. Vagrancy act, if you just chill and idle and they say, uh, uh, you have a job? No, I'm waiting to get a job. Oh, you're waiting to get a job? Well, you're idle. And because you're idle, guess what? We're going to take you, take you to jail. And now they have a deal with the quote-unquote ex-slave masters where they're selling these convicts back to the slave masters for work. Where at a point now, we are no longer offering ourselves to be hired. Now we are being resold back into that captive sense. Fast forward all the way to modern day times now. What ethnic group has the highest rate of unemployment in America? Horatio. Horatio. Not numbers. If we look at numbers, we're looking at the Caucasian people. Because it's way more of them than us here in America. But ratio-wise, our community has the highest rate, disproportionate, highest rate of unemployment. Where we're trying to go and offer ourselves for somebody to hire us, and people are trying to understand. We go to college, we get this degree, now we're looking for a job, and now we have a huge issue. We got all this debt, all this other situation. Remember, that's the creditor debitor relationship. It says that if you follow my statute laws and commandments, you will be the lender and not the borrower. You'll be the creditor and not the debitor. But if you don't, now is a situation where it's reversed. Now you're the debitor putting yourself before the creditor. And a lot of times we do the same thing, we fill out applications for. Uh, store credit cards, regular credit cards, loans for homes, we're always the borrower and never the lender. But when we get back to the statute laws commandments and understand the relationship that we need to have with other elements and corporations of society, we want to put ourselves in a creditor status so that way we won't be the debtor. And that's just a way for us to get breathing room, like my brother back there said, and that's, um, shout out for the upcoming lecture, Uzi brother Uzi Yahoo, breathing room to allow us some degree of quality of life and survival until we get redeemed out of captivity. So ultimately what I'm saying, I'm not trying to scare y'all and say we can't use this anymore, but if we do use it, use it with conditions, or what I'll say, conditional acceptance of this text relating to the transatlantic slave trade, but you got to do so in a very careful sense to be able to explain everything that I just showed y'all. So that way when you're conveying this or becoming an apologist for the Hebraic or Hebrew Israelite worldview, you can break it down in a very academic way so that way they can see that what it is that we're conveying is not based on dogma, but it's based on inductive reasoning and thorough research and examination of the text, of history, of culture, and overall context. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.